Okay, so since everyone now seems to be awake and has had their first coffee, um, it's now my pleasure to welcome Tio of SIS11, who will tell you how to simply protect your edge. Give him a warm welcome. Hello. Yeah, thanks for having me. My name is Theo from SIS11, working as a technical lead for the network. And Arnold asked me to uh, make you aware of uh, that SIS11 is a proud sponsor of PeeringDB since a couple of weeks. And first, <laughs> but first of all, I would like to introduce SIS11 for those who do not know us. SIS11 is a managed hosting company and upstream provider from Berlin, founded in 2007. And we're currently serving more than 300 customers, running more than 3,000 servers. And our network includes 10 points of presence in Berlin, Zurich, Frankfurt, and Amsterdam. With this presentation, I would like to continue a series of talks, thanks to Oliver from NetCop, um, about sharing concepts. And in this case, I would like to tell you how we protect our network against the dark side or the cyber side of the internet. Because nearly everybody of you, or in this room, has suffered from route leaks and DDoS attacks in the past. And there are some recent examples. For example, the attacks on Krebs on security and OVH, with more than one terabit per second. Or the route leaks from YouTube and Malaysia Telecom, I think in 2006, in the last past years. But even if everybody knows the problem, I think that the majority of ISPs in the world still filter on max prefix limits at most and hope for the best. They're using static filtering, using max prefix limits, but they still forward route leaks and are often not protected against DDoS attacks. But before I present our solution for this, I would like to ask you how you are doing. And therefore, I would like to ask you to open your... Is it working? One second. I tested it before. Now it's working. Yeah, now it's working. So please take your computer or smartphone and go to this link on the paulevcom slash dnoc8 and answer A, B, or C. A, if you use no filtering at all, B, if you use static filters and or max prefix limits, and C, if you use dynamic filters combined with APKI. And please be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Still changing? Yeah. Okay, but I think the statement is true. Um, from what we have seen, so most of you, 90% uh, is, is filtering by using static filters and max prefix limits. So even if not everybody has voted yet, I'm going to skip because it does not change towards C. Yeah, okay, 90%. Okay. And the question that I ask is, is filtering not easy enough? Or are how-tos or best current practices missing? Because I think it's definitely not a lack of importance. And we at SIS11, and I told this a couple of times before, are believing in the Pareto principle that if everybody in this room would spend 20% of effort in building up their filters, we can achieve more than 80% of security. And during the last talks uh, at the ECO, I was asked, or DKIX, I was asked if I would be able to present our solution. And uh, the, yeah, the answer is yes, I can. And therefore, I would like to share our approach, uh, which is not perfect, for sure, but it has proven its abilities in the past. And this approach is based on prefix filters, and we filter out Bogan ASNs, Bogan prefixes, IXP networks, own networks, just to name a few. And hopefully everybody in this room does the same. And this is how it looks in our Juniper network, static filters for those on the left. But those filters even do not protect your network from 
yeah, from getting prefixes announced which are hijacked or are garbage. And therefore, we believe that dynamic prefix filtering is the most important thing. And who of you wouldn't like to have a full feature dynamics prefix generator which is open source and plug and play? But as far as we know, this does not exist. Or does anybody else have one? Okay, no, it seems not. No. So the only solution for us to build our own tool, which we call the AutoGen. And the AutoGen reads all the AS sets from our peers from a Git-based comma-separated file, and then generates a Juniper-style XML prefix list. And those lists are then applied to the routers via netconf, and this is executed by cronjob every night. And in this example, you can see our peering configuration for on DKIX for the peer Yahoo and the corresponding prefix list where we are filtering on all prefixes from 4 AS Yahoo or longer. And if you have noticed an email yesterday on the DKIX mailing list from Yahoo, they fat fingered a route leak. And um, this filter you've seen before prevented SIS11 from accepting the routes which were announced from Yahoo at DKIX just as a small example. But to accomplish this kind of filtering, we're using three different tools. And the first tool we're using is BGPQ3. And BGPQ3 is an open source prefix filter generator for different types of devices, which extracts prefix lists or generates prefix lists based on the route objects from the IRRs. And the default IRR used is, of course, RADB. The tool supports Juniper and Cisco and also 32-bit ASNs and IPv6. And as most of the ones I'm going to present, it's available on GitHub. And as everybody in this room loves aggregation, and especially this is what our experience was, your routing engines uh, appreciate short lists. We're using two tools called Aggregate and Aggregate 6. The first one can be installed via APT, and the second one is available on GitHub, thanks to Job Snyders. We are trying to, to keep the lists as small as possible. And this is how it looks. The out again then, and yes, it's a bash, uh, the out again loops uh, through the list of AS sets. And for each object, it's generating a query against the who is mirror, doing the aggregate, and then generates a prefix list item, which can be seen here, um, and puts this into an XML formatted uh, or XML format. And this, this file, or the output file we generated, which is then compared to check if there is a diff to the file before, uh, to only apply to the router in case that there is a change. Um, we're using the Juniper NetConf client. And as our network is running on Juno's, Juno's 14 plus, there's a script called edit configuration PL, which can be found on the GitHub repository from Juniper. And this script, if, ex if, if executed, uh, reads the XML for metric con configuration and applies it directly to, to the router. But please be careful, the script does not give you the possibility of having a show compare or commit confirmed. So everything you're putting in will be directly committed to the router. And this sounds pretty easy, but uh, yeah, even dynamic prefix filtering has its challenges. And the first the first solution for one of the challenges is that we're using RPKI and max prefix limits for peers with more than 10,000 prefixes. And if I have a look on our network, we only have two peers, or two peers means peers on IXPs, uh, which announce more than 10,000 prefixes. And this is Retin and uh, Hurricane Electric. Because otherwise, the commit time on your Juniper device is going to heavily increase due to the config validation check which is performed. And unfortunately, and uh, I asked Juniper earlier uh, for an update, uh, the dynamic database which is used to bypass the config validation is unfortunately not yet netconf writable. We are also using the ASN number instead of the AS set if uh, the peer hasn't configured or created one. And uh, therefore sometimes running into trouble because not all prefixes are covered by the, eight, by the ASN or by the outnum object. Um, so sometimes it makes manual intervention necessary. Furthermore, we've installed our own mirror instead of using the AreaDB because the AreaDB has a horrible performance and sometimes, and I think DKIX made the same experience, is also dropping your connection suddenly. And this mirror I mentioned before is running on IRD. 
Uh, and we, we are going to mirror, or we are mirroring the RIPE database and some other trashy databases. And for example, we are mirroring the LTDB, which is the alternative database, because Microsoft's AS set is only maintained in this database. <laughs> and, and we are also using a downsized rate RIPE database, because our challenge was to increase the performance. And for example, in the RIPE database, um, there's a lot of information we don't, do not need. For example, the contact information and, and, and other things. And the RIPE database currently has a size of a couple of gigabyte. So we decided to only mirror the outnum objects, the route objects, and the route 6 objects. And uh, thereby we were able to increase the performance by more than 100%. We are also planning to set up a second mirror for redundancy reasons. And if you or DKIX, for example, would like to test this kind of setup, just uh, let me or my colleague Vincent know and we are going to whitelist your IP addresses. Yeah, now we have added uh, dynamic filters. And the next step for us was to turn on RPKI. And therefore, we're using the RIPE validator, currently version 2.23, which can be downloaded or is available on the RIPE's website. And we have, of course, created ROAs for our allocations. And yeah, I would be happy if everybody in the room does so as well. Below, you can see the front end of the validator software and an example for our prefixes with the validation state valid. With adding RPKI, we have introduced two fields or different modes in our Git-based comma-separated file where we're configuring the peers. And those modes are, first of all, moderate, where we reject invalid announcements. And this is used or configured for all Sys11 customers and all upstreams. And the second mode is strict, where we accept only valid announcements. And this is used sometimes on a case-by-case -case basis for IXP route servers and customers um, which are not aware of configuring their devices correctly. And this is how it looks, the configuration for Epic I validation. On the left side, uh, we have the mirrors, two in this case, and on the right side, you can see a downstream import policy where we are setting communities and validation state based on the entry in the validation database of the RPKI mirror. And there was one important learning for us. As the software is running on Java, we had to increase the maximum memory allocation to, I don't know, 12 gigabyte, because uh, yeah, otherwise the mirror dies constantly. As RPKI is a promising feature, or because there are still some open challenges. And the first one is, that we're currently rejecting more than 10,000 invalid routes, and it's definitely worse to have a look on them. The biggest polluter from our side, or what we see, is one certain tier one provider, which announces, can be seen here, announces nearly 4,000 RPKI invalid prefixes. So prefixes which are explicitly RPKI invalid. And in special cases, for example, if you have customers with right legacy resources, which have difficulties to create ROAs in the lib portal, you can use the whitelisting feature on the validator software. And last but not least, there is an open discussion about censorship, but this should not be part of the presentation and can be easily bypassed by just disabling or not using RPKI. In our implementation, uh, if the mirror dies, invalid announcements are still accepted. But if strict filtering is in place for a peer and the mirror dies, no prefix would be accepted. So our solution was to set up a second mirror and use both of them simultaneously. The alternative might be to abstain from strict filtering. Now our edge seems protected, but it's not only about filtering. So 11 is getting attacked, as most of the, for example, uh, hosters in Germany, by DDoS. And our challenge are attacks with a size below 100 gigabits per second, with an average between 10 and 50 gigabit, from which are 99% volumetric and 99% are stupid. So a lot of attacks against web servers of our customers are hitting uh, UDP port 80, and therefore are easy, relatively easy to mitigate. But unfortunately, even if we have larger customers from the public sector, no of them is yeah, willing to pay for a third-party solution, for example, from Prolexic or Arbor. But again, before I present our solution, a way of doing, I would like to ask you again. So please take out, and hopefully it works now. Web 2.0. So please take your smartphone again, and go to the... 
and go to the link, same again as before. And answer the question if you're using manual detection and black holing filtering, if you're using automated detection, or if you use on a, uh, rely on a third party product. Okay, I think it's again what we expected. Most of you voted for A. And more than 60% is doing manual uh, detection and black holing or filtering. So I think then our, well, my presentation might be very interesting. Okay, our solution, solution to cope with those attacks was to tremendously increase the upstream capacity. We have moved all ports into link aggregation groups and eliminated all single 10 gig links on the network. We have furthermore installed a software called FastNetMon for detection and we have enabled flow spec within our backbone for easy mitigation. And FastNetMon is an open source tool which I introduced at DKIX technical meeting a couple of months ago uh, for DDoS attack detection which works on user-defined thresholds. And the tool collects its data via NetFlow, SFlow, IPFix, or even port mirroring is possible, and has inbuilt support for Graphite, InfluxDB, uh, or XRBGP. And can be also found on GitHub, and hopefully Pavel is looking the live stream from DNOC. And this is how it looks in our network operation center, where we're displaying the, the data from FastNetBun in Graphite, or um, showing it in, in, uh, in Grafana, where you have a look on the history of attacks of the last past days. But detection is good, as most of you might know, but it's an awful situation if you're sitting in front of your computer and have no possibility to mitigate an uh, attack e effectively. And therefore, as mentioned before, we have enabled FlowSpec. FlowSpec gives us the possibility to propagate, BGP fil uh, propagate firewall filters on layer 3.4 within our network by BGP. And instead of a discard, which is classically used, we can also use a rate limit. This is pretty nice uh, for customers if we can keep them partially online or just increase the rate limit if, um, yeah, at the end of the attack. Furthermore, um, by enabling flow spec on our upstream sessions, the maximum attack bandwidth which we can handle is not longer limited to our edge capacity. And according to Juniper, Flow spec scales up to 10,000 flow routes per Juniper MX box. We're to, uh, additionally, we're using communities to decide if the flow route should be distributed within our network only or if it should be announced upstream. And in case of attack, which is be done or could be done in less than two minutes, whereby fast metanol needs approximately one minute for detection in the most cases. An email is sent together with an SMS to the NOC engineer on duty. And the funny or the good thing is that the email um, uh, encompasses a, a packet capture of the last 500 packets uh, together with the source and destination IP and protocol and port. And this information is then used to generate the flow route within our network. And in this case, we are mitigating an attack against port 0 and port 4444, protocol is UDP, and then we're adding the community announced to upstream to distribute the route to our upstream provider and setting the action to discard. The route is then propagated internally within our network, but be careful, you have to create also a slash 24 or whatever more specific route to attract the traffic towards your upstream provider. Now you might ask about automated mitigation. Fast net money version one can do exa-based BGP, uh, exa BGP based black holing, but don't try to use flow spec because flow spec in fast net one is uh, yeah, somewhat of unstable alpha. But in version 2.0, GoBGP is used instead. And uh, it can, the software can uh, also decide if a rate limit or discard should be used in case of attack. Furthermore, the configuration of your networks, which should be protected, are not longer maintained in a static file, 
and they are now learned by BGP. We are currently testing Fast Netbond in version 2.0, and it seems the most promising option in combination with a rate limit in case of attack and a short, um, a short timer after you know, that the route should expire uh, to mitigate um, most of the attacks. At the end, we have used self-made filters and open source tools to combine a working solution for us. It was a very time-consuming process, took a couple of months, but it leads um, yeah, to less effort for the engineer on duty and the network team. And it's very budget-friendly, or was very budget-friendly. It's not yet perfect and it's subject to further improvement, but it has protected us in the past and it does the job. So, I hope this talk might be thought-provoking for at least one of you. Um, and because we believe in sharing, and it was discussed already uh, on the DNOC mailing list, we will make our filters public. And we encourage everybody in this room to do so the same. Uh, because the idea of sharing those concepts and filters came up during the last eco-competence group meeting in Frankfurt. And Sebastian from Norris then created a repository under the DNOC organization. And we are also looking for volunteers to compile a beginner set or draft BCP from those data. Thanks. Any questions? Hi, thank you for writing yet another tool to surpass all the tools. <laughs> uh, did you consider IRR toolset? Uh, yes, we did. But uh, the easiest way for us, and this is what the, the speaker before or the two speakers before said, the easiest was in this case because we have also limited resources on the network team in terms of system operations, uh, was to use an existing, existing tool set and just adopt uh, what's already there. Stefan von Denig. Yeah. Mm, thank you for the talk. I really like the BCP approach and uh, I also was in contact with Gerd Döring who um, is, is hosting this um, Martian filter website. So I came recently up on this website and then I saw the, the DNOC mailing list thingy. What I would like to see is not only uh, about Martian policies for the different platforms like XE, XR and the Jonas stuff, but also when I, when, I, when I started with all this Martian thing, I, I was thinking about um, my backbone thing. What, what do you filter in the backbone and so on? So, so I would like to encourage the guys maybe to put some knowledge about um, best practice of, uh, in terms of security according to your backbone design. So I think there's a lot of magic you could implement also too. And that's not pretty, pretty uh, good documented. So a lot of people say, okay, your egress or your edge um, filter should look like this, but how do you design um, your backbone to be rock solid? Yeah. yeah, Yeah. so I think we had two different ideas. And the first one was to just publish filters so that everybody can have a look how other networks are doing. And the second one is uh, to, yeah, to have a, like a beginner set because a lot of ISPs have absolutely no clue about how to, how to start. So the idea was to, to compile this yeah, code of draft BCP that a, that a new peer or new layer uh, can have a look on the on the filter list and say, okay, yes, if I implement its best effort, of course, but if I implement those those filters, it's like like a start. And, and another idea, I haven't finished it yet, but uh, I would also like to encourage people to to create extra BGP um, scenarios to test their filters, so that you can uh, create the extra BGP stuff, check it out, run it on your test box against your lab router, for example, yeah. because this is really imminent to make sure that the thing you want to achieve is really achieved, especially when you are maybe migrating from journals to XR or the, the other, way, other way around where you're playing with stuff so that it's reproducible and that you apply um, the current best practices of software development also in network engineering. Yeah. More questions? <laughs> Marcos. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we already talked about, but maybe I share with the community as well. Uh, we once tried to do uh, prefix filtering on peers as well. However, we have a few larger ones. And uh, we ended up in screwing our network. I ended up with a box which I, well, uh, on a Juniper, you have the management DB, which simply grows in size. And if you have, don't fast, uh, if, you, if it's certain size, you get problems with the commit time. However, in our case, it got that worse that uh, during the commit, um, the routing process daemon in Junos 
took that long that our uh, LDP session flew away at the time. Uh, if you do that in a box in the middle on the core, you quite have some problems. Yeah. Um, so the idea was, uh, but I never got to that, and I heard some people eventually already doing that, is to put uh, IR, um, internet registry data route objects into some kind of faked R, uh, R pay, key, uh, pay key stuff. Okay. To avoid larger lists. Oh, okay. Is anyone doing that here? No? Okay, just curious. Yeah. yeah, and also in terms of flow spec, because you mentioned scalability, there is also an open question about memory exhaustion on flow spec, so be careful what you're doing, and depending on the size of your network, yeah, please double check how many flow routes um, you, you might accept on your router to, to not screw it up. Yeah. Okay, do we have any further questions? Okay, then thank you very much to you.